2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38. We're studying the life of Elisha. Elisha, of course, was the servant of Elijah. Elisha's asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit before Elijah was taken into heaven. And Elisha is doing some miracles in chapter 4, chapter 5. Uh, we're seeing about five different miracles, things that happen. And we see it chapter 6. But we've been studying this, and it's amazing, one, how they correspond with... Where are we at again? 2 Kings chapter 4, right? Okay, thank you. Verse 38. It's amazing how the life of Elisha, because he followed Elijah, follows the example of Elijah's faith, of Elijah's life. His miracles even uh, resemble them. If you looked into 1 Kings 17, you would see similar miracles that Elijah did. But then you see Elisha in 2 Kings 4, 5, 6, you see him do some of the same miracles, except they're greater. And it reminds me of when Jesus said that his disciples would do greater works than him. Because Jesus was proclaiming, Jesus was bringing the kingdom of God. Jesus was laying down his life so that the spirit could come back and fill us to overflowing. And if we would follow his example as his servants, as his disciples, as his learners, we would do greater miracles because now we have the mystery of the gospel revealed to us and we can share the truth of the gospel. And if anyone believes it, that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, they can be saved. See, that mystery was hidden in the Old Testament. In fact, the gospel is hidden. The New Testament gospel is hidden everywhere in the Old Testament. And that's what we want to see out of this and be able to expound on. And we'll bring it out, but I want you to understand that you can search the scriptures and find this salvation. You can grow in relationship and God will give you as much as you want. As, but you must get in the word, prayer, and fellowship in order to grow in that relationship with God. So many people tell me that they know God, they believe in God. So many people tell me that they, oh, I've been born again. And then they know absolutely nothing about the God who saved them. They know nothing about the God who died for them. They know nothing about the God who wrote them a love letter. And I'm not making an indictment. I'm saying if you really have been saved, delivered from your sin nature, set free from the penalty of sin, and the Spirit of God comes in, then you want to know that God who would lay down his life for you. You want to understand, why did you do that? If it was somebody that was sitting on death row because they was a murderer and their date was coming so that they were going to have to go to the electric chair, we used to say, we now say the lethal injection, and you were sitting there getting ready for your last meal, and the doors open and expecting to have your last meal and you were going to eat what you had ordered. Instead, the guard leads somebody else in. And he tells you, come with me. And he leads you out. And somebody else eats your last meal and dies for you. Wouldn't you want to know why? Wouldn't you want to know who? Wouldn't you want to tell everybody? I mean, think about it. It'd be the New York Times bestseller. I was on death row and I was getting ready to die and then somebody came in and they died for me. We want to tell everybody that. And that's exactly what happened. We were dead in our sins and trespasses and Christ came and died for us. He took the penalty and the power and he gave us new life and he gave us new hope. And it's here in the Old Testament. Chapter 4 begins with a widow. It begins with a widow who has 
a couple sons, some fruit from her life. She was a, married to a prophet, and he died. And Elisha tells her to borrow vessels, to go to your neighbors and knock door to door and do some explaining. And tell them that you have nothing. And I want to borrow some empty vessels and put oil in them. And isn't that how God brings salvation? He puts oil in empty vessels. And as I was studying again this week, she said in, she had nothing in the house but a jar of oil. And I guess that word comes from a little bitty jar, a tiny jar. Because I had expounded that I think it was probably the jar of oil that she used to bury her husband with. And so that's all she has is some of the perfumed oil left over. And she obeys and God puts oil in the vessel and that's how he brings salvation. When you and I believe the word of God, when we believe that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead and we're saved, that oil comes into our empty vessel all by believing. We were in unbelief and now we believe. And then when we believe what happens we begin to want to have fellowship. That's the 8 through 37, the, the Shunammite woman. She begins to have fellowship with the man of God. Don't forget, the prophet in the Old Testament brought the word of God. He's the one that always relayed the word of God. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, in past times in divers' manners, God spoke through the prophet. But in these last days, he speak, speaks by his son. So anytime they're hearing the word of God from the prophet, they're literally listening to God himself. But the prophet would bring it to them. She begins to have fellowship. She even builds a house and a place for the word of God to come, the prophet to come and stay. And at the same time, we see as the prophet staying there, and she begins to listen and obey and take care of the word of God, the word of God wants to give her fruit, and she has a son. And then we see that son even die. And what happens? God gives him new life. He raises him from the dead. Just as if he's born again. Just like you and I. Again, we see the gospel. But are you having fellowship with the word of God? Have you made a place in your house, in your home, in your heart for the word of God to put it first? Once you begin doing that and you're having fellowship with God, you have a place with God, then you want to begin to sup with God, as the Bible says. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will open the door, I will come in and, and dine with him and he with me. So you have to open the door to the word of God. But when you open the door to the word of God, guess what? Some enemy is going to come in and try to lie to you too. You have to begin to make a place for the word of God. The Shunammite woman did. The Shunammite woman did, and it gave her fruit, and that fruit was stayed alive because of the Word of God. And now we come to our text, it keeps going. It keeps going. We're going to see here that Elisha, or the Word of God, puts more ingredients in and purifies the pot of stew. What are we talking about? The next two miracles that happen, we're going to be talking about again, food. Because God wants to have a fellowship meal with us. He wants you to make a place in your home, in your heart, for his word. To sit down with his word, to let rest in your house. And he wants you to eat. And so the next two are going to be parables about sanctification. About purifying your heart. About what you're eating and what's going in to your heart. Watch this. And Elisha, Elisha means God is salvation, returned to Gilgal. Now, Gilgal was where the prophets stayed. Uh, it means will or rolling, which is interesting. Uh, the first, it's the first place that Israel camped west of the Jordan when they crossed over the Jordan River, east of Jericho. Before you remember, they took the city Jericho. What was Jericho? Jericho was the first fruits of the land. Listen to me, this is important. And God said, 
Jericho's mind. Everything at Jericho's mind. And you're going to march around it for seven days. On the seventh day, when you march around that city, you march around seven times and then you blow the trumpets and all the people will shout and the walls will fall down. The first fruits was always for God. Pay attention because in verse 42, we're going to see a man come with some first fruits. It all ties in. So Gilgal is the place where they first camped out. And it's also the place, if you remember, Joshua met with the, the Lord, Jesus Christ. He's seen a man with, and he said, whose side are you on, ours or theirs? And he said, no. But as the commander of the armies of the living God, I have come. In other words, I'm not on your side, Joshua, and I'm not on Jericho's side. I'm on the Lord's side. I am the Lord. Whose side are you on? Which side are you going to choose? Are you going to be for the Lord, or do you want to stay on your own side, which is the side of death? Salvation brings us onto the Lord's side. Back into the salvation of the Lord brings us back under the authority of God, into the army of God, to be the people of God for the glory of God. And then we began to have fellowship with God. So this is the place, Gilgal is also the city uh, where Samuel was judged, or was a judge, it's where he judged from and in and, and the book of Judges, and where Saul was made king here in Gilgal. Remember Saul hiding he was hiding, but before it was over with, he, instead, of, uh, instead of hiding, he was building statues to himself, and, he, and he, God took the spirit from him and gave him an evil spirit. It was later used for worship of Baal, false worship. Anytime we talk of gods other than God, um, we're speaking of God's small g. <laughs> So Elisha returned to Gilgal. Here now it's where a school of the prophets are. And look what it says. And there was a famine in the land. King James says a dearth. Anybody know what a dearth is? It's a famine. <laughs> I never heard the word. King James says there was a dearth in the land. I'm like, really? Did you kill it? I don't know what a dearth is. I'm sorry. It means a famine when you look it up. Here, I'll tell you what it means. Look. Hunger. That's what it means. More or less an extensive. Do you have a hunger for the word of God? Listen, do you have a hunger for the word of God? If the spirit of God is in you, it wants to take that which is Christ and make it real to you. We should have a hunger for the word of God. If we don't have a hunger for the word of God, you should ask God to give me a hunger for your word. Because he's sanctifying us. He's cleansing us. He's changing us through his word. He says, sanctify them with truth. Your word is truth. If we don't have a hunger to dig deep and find out what God has done, what he's doing, what he's going to do, everything that's going on, ever went on, that we need to know is in this word. 66 books by 40 authors. You know, if you wish to go and look at Revelation 13, you would find that there's going to be a mark that people are tricked into. Revelation 19 says they're tricked. They're deceived into taking it. Revelation 18 says, how did they deceive them? How did they deceive them? To pharmacy. The great men of the earth merchandise their pharmacy, their witchcraft, their medication, and they deceive them into taking medicine, and they deceive them into giving their life to worship the devil through pharmacy. That's what it says. You can go look at it. It's in uh, uh, Revelation 18, 23. What do we have right now? The great men of the earth. What do we have right now? The George Soros's. What do we have right now? The Elon Musk. What do we have right now that are, that are out there peddling? The, 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 the Anthony Fauci's. They're all out there peddling pharmacy, medication. They're out there telling us, go get a vaccine. You know why they're telling us a vaccine? They don't want to tell you that it's gene therapy. A vaccine, there's a law that no drug company can be sued for any damage or death that's caused by a vaccine. But there's no law that protects them against gene therapy. And this that they are doing is a new type of science that's never been used on people. It's called gene therapy. And they won't tell you that about 1,700 people have died from it, not to mention all the other side effects, which could amount to three or 4,000 more people that's had side effects. 
But what they would say was, well, we did 100 million people. That's only 5,000. Really? And what kind of help have they had from it? See, they have lied to us. They're merchandising us. They're making money off a fear that they caused, that they created, and then they want us to buy it. They want us to buy into it, and they're going to deceive us, those who buy into it, into worshiping the Antichrist. It's there. There's a famine in the land for the word of God. See, the word of God tells us what's happening, but nobody wants to hear it. Listen, look at Amos. Turn to Amos chapter 11. If you, if you don't believe that God's doing it. Turn to Amos chapter 11. Or excuse me, chapter 8, verse 11. Amos. Amos. Yeah, that's one of them little bitty minor prophets. But he's a prophet indeed. Look at verse 11. Behold, listen up, the days are coming, says the Lord God. Listen, we should always want to know what God says. He spoke and created the heavens and the earth. He spoke. It's right before Obadiah. It's after Joel. Uh, it's on page 1571. Oh, Amos, chapter 8, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine, a dirt on the land. Not a famine for bread. There will be plenty of bread. Not a famine or a thirst for water. Plenty of water to drink. You guys got everything you need? but of hearing the words of the Lord. See, people will read their Bible. People will go to church. People will, but they don't hear it. See, faith comes by hearing. When you hear the word of God, you're hearing attentively to obey. You're hearing it to correct yourself and say, Holy Spirit, I need help here. I see that there's a problem. I'm convicted of my sin. I shouldn't be living this way. I'm in the house of the Lord. I've been given a great salvation. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God says, you continue to ignore, and I will bring a dearth. I will bring a famine to where you can't even hear. I'm going to do it. You'll be standing in the house of God and still not understand. Still not comprehend. Still not have the faith that will allow you to live for God. Look at verse 12. They shall wander from my commandments. What we just study in Psalms 119.10. What did we just study? Anybody remember the verse? How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commands. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is all about sin, original sin, unbelieving, not obeying, being deceived, intoxicated into thinking that we can follow the pharmacy and the sorcery of the authorities of the earth and ignore God. That's what they're doing. They're ignoring God. And they think they have a plan and God laughs at them in derision. And God brings this famine Look what this says. They shall wander from sea to sea. They go everywhere. They might even be talking about God, but they're not obeying his commands. They're wondering. They're intoxicated with the things of the world, with the money of the world, with the power of the land, instead of surrendering to the power of God. And so many have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof, which is the sanctifying and cleansing power of the spirit and the word together when you hear with a desire to obey when you hear the word of god and it produces faith and you trust god you're not afraid of man you're, you're bold as a lion like the righteous are supposed to be and you go out with a message to tell people that i'm not going to follow the world that's how adam and eve gave us our first sin nature 
those that are saved and, and, and headed for glory, those that are being sanctified, we're trusting in the Lord to lead us, not the world, not some uh, uh, intoxicating thing that is here, but Jesus. They shall wander. Oh, Lord, help me not wander from your commandments. They wander from sea to sea, from north to east. Now, how do you do that? You know, we usually say north to south or east to west. Yeah. How confused can they be to be wandering from north to east? They will run from north to east. That's yeah, right. they yeah. shall run from, excuse me, run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Are you listening to me? They made up their own religions. They're living their own ways. They set their own standards, but it's not the standards of the Word of God, of the examples of God. Let me tell you right now, people, there is a famine, there is a dearth in the land today for the Word of God. There's a famine, and God has brought it. God is bringing strong delusion on them who would not believe the Word of God and follow and live by the Word of God. He brings a dearth of famine, and you listen and you listen, but you do nothing about it. And you can go to conference and to conference and to church and to church. Look at all the church hopping. That's what people are doing. There's no real church growth anymore. It's people jumping from church to church. You ask anybody that does anything about churches, and they'll go, well, the real growth in churches is just people going looking for somebody to tickle their ear. They go from one church to the other instead of realizing that it's the Word of God. It's not the church. It's the Word of God. It's the God of the Word. It's the salvation that He's brought. All you need to do is sit down with this Word. The reason we have fellowship and we stay in the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship is so that we don't end up running off and following and drinking the Kool-Aid of the world so that we don't get intoxicated with some lie and follow it. We keep one another accountable. Yet everybody does their own thing because we're living like the days of judges. There's a famine in the land. Everybody wants help. They're all seeking help. They need help. People are offering help. But they don't go to God for help. They don't go to his word for help. They don't expect his help. They get it from everybody else. Listen. Salvation. The spirit comes into an empty vessel. When that vessel has the spirit of God in it and you've been sanctified, then you set apart the Lord Jesus. He sanctified you. Now you set him apart. You make a place in your home, in your house. I'm back in our text in 2 Kings. And when you do that, God is going to bring fruit. He's going to bring life. He's going to bring new life. He's going to make you a new creation. And then you've got to return to your first love. The first love that you had in the garden before. Just like Adam and Eve. Elisha returns there and there's a famine. Someone says there's a famine in chapter 8 of Kings. I don't know if it's that famine. I don't know. There's a famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were setting before him. It's interesting. New Testament times, when a teacher was teaching, the men would stand. So evidently he's not teaching because they're all sitting. And he said to his servant, remember his servant Gehazi, keep an eye on Gehazi. See, right now we're watching Elisha, who was servant to Elijah. Gehazi is supposed to be faithful to Elisha and we're going to find that he's going to grow weary of it and he's going to sell out for money. In fact, he grows weary in the next text and doubts the Lord's word. We're seeing the, the downward collapse of this one who is supposed to be following. He's supposed to be listening. He's supposed to be obeying and trusting the word of God and his eyes get somewhere else. Notice this. Now the sons of the prophets were setting before him. Before who? Before Elisha. The sons of the prophets were setting before God his salvation. And he said to his servant Gehazi, Put on the large pot, 
put on a great pot, King James. Remember, it's a great pot. It's not just large, it's great. This is great news. It's not just good news, it's great news that we hear in the gospel. And boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Listen. If Gehazi is before Elisha and learning from him, he's telling Elisha, his servant, to train the other prophets. Notice the discipleship going on. Notice the handing down that's going on. I've been walking before you, Gehazi. Now you walk before them and serve them. The gospel is about being a servant. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. If there's a relationship with God, you'll be turned into a servant or you will walk away just like Gehazi does. So he tells him to put on a great pot. And that's important because we see a great pot. Then we're going to see, we've seen a, a um, seems like there was another great, oh, great woman. The Shumanite woman was a great woman. There's going to be a great pot. And then we're going to see that in chapter 5, Naaman is a great man before his king in Syria. And great is this. Uh, it's large here. It's great. It means great in any sense, high or long, but it's proud. Listen to me. I'll put on a big pot. It's proud. The Shumanite woman was, was proud in her heart. We've seen her bow down and receive the fruit of God. But when, when Elisha said, what can we do for you? She said, nothing. I live with my own people. I'm okay. But the servant knew that she didn't have any children. And if he didn't have children in those days, she was still under a curse. Listen to me. So you got to bear fruit or you're still under a curse. Christ died so you could bear fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he doesn't want that fruit to die in you. He wants you to hand it out to others. I know this gets a little bit deep. Simply, I think the pot is your heart and the food that you're putting in your heart, the great pot. See, it's a great prideful heart and it's already been filled with poison because you're gathering and eating at the wrong table and then you add the ingredients of the Lord to it and it doesn't harm you. See, God's sanctifying us. But anytime you stop adding the ingredients of the Lord, the flour... Your old nature just comes right back and takes over. The poison just takes over. You have to be submitting to it. You have to be faithfully following it. Think about it. Even when this miracle is done by God, through the word of God, the prophet, given over by the servant of God who was handing it out, even when it's done, it's God's power. Listen to me. But in order to eat that bowl of soup, in order to follow this word of God that takes the poison out of your heart, here's the ingredients. You have to have some faith. Because think about it. If you were literally sitting there and, and they go, oh, man of God, there's poison in the soup. There's death in it. And he goes, bring me some flour. And he sprinkled some flour in it. Would you actually eat it? Think about it. Wouldn't it take some faith now to eat that? If you, if you, Oh, wait a minute now. I think... Nobody fell down dead, but somebody's dying and there was poison gourds in there. Mm -hmm. You want me to eat that just because you said you dropped some new ingredients in it? I don't think so. So where's your faith? Do you really believe the word of God? Do you really believe the word of God that it warns us that pharmacy is going to deceive us? Do you really believe the word of God that it warns us that you cannot die, you're going to go to sleep and be with the Lord. Do you really believe the word of God that you've been set free from the penalty and the power of sin? Do you really believe that the Spirit's in you and you're indestructible until He's finished with you and you can go out and tell other people? Do you really have faith to eat that soup? This ain't deception. Listen, do you remember that? You guys remember that? The rock soup? You ever heard of rock soup? 
I'm going to mess it up probably, but yeah. you remember that? Yes. The, the, the vagabond comes to the door and knocks on the door of the woman and says, you have anything to eat? And she says, I don't have anything. I'm sorry. He says, well, do you have a pot with some water? Remember she, when? She says, I do. He says, well, have you ever ate rock soup? She's like, no. He says, well, let me fix you up some rock soup. And he puts the pot on the stove and he puts the rock inside of it and it starts to boil. And he says, you know what would really make this soup good? If you had some carrots. If we added some carrots to this, this would be the best rock soup there is. And so we, I got some carrots. And I cut up some carrots. And I tell it my own way. And, and he goes through all these ingredients. And pretty soon he's just got vegetable soup. But it's still called rock soup. Listen, this ain't a deception. This is a pot of stew. It's your heart. It had poison in it because somebody filled their lap with some gourds and they put it in. The enemy came in and lied and deceived and filled our heart with a sin nature. And when you add the ingredients that God tells you to add and you believe the word of God and you follow the word of God and you get into the word prayer and fellowship, it takes the poison out of your nature. And it fills you with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such there is no law, and nothing can harm you. But that takes faith. Because I'm telling you right now, if I was sitting there, it would be really hard, wouldn't it? Yeah. Wait a minute, there's death in the soup. You knew that it was wild gourds. Somebody said cucumbers. I don't know. They grew on a vine. Listen, we're supposed to be attached to the vine. This is all about the New Testament, people. It's right here. We're supposed to abide in the vine. John 15, 5. He says, if you abide in the vine, or it, it, what did he say? I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you abide in the vine, you can bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Is that right? I haven't quoted that scripture in so long. Uh, remains in me and I in him he can bear much fruit but apart from me you can do nothing thank you yeah and here's a wild vine now another way to look at this and another way to look at this is that this person be, the oil comes into the vessel she builds a place she makes a place and she be in the church the bride makes a place in her heart for fellowship with the word of God and begins to bear fruit. And then what happens? Somebody comes and poisons the fruit and puts something else in the pot. Because that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to bring some false teaching. He wants to bring some stuff in. And that's why you have to build a personal relationship and get in the word of God and stay close to God and ask God and seek him with your whole heart and hide his word in your heart. That's why we do scripture memory verse. To quite literally hide the word of God in our hearts. If they wish to take all of our Bibles and we were memorizing the word of God, we could sit down together and quote and talk about much of the scripture without even having the written word. That's why people in foreign countries that are not allowed to have Bibles, they don't have Bibles. There's one Bible between a hundred of them. When they get into the presence of a place where a Bible's at, they will stay there for four, five, six hours or all day. They'll walk a long way just to hear the Word of God. In America, we all have four or five hundred Bibles in our houses, and we just leave them there with dust on them. And we don't know what they say because we're intoxicated, and God is bringing a famine and strong delusion because we do not believe His Word. Listen. He says to the servant, put on a great pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Verse 39. So one went out into the field. Notice this. The servant didn't go out into the field. The servant must be putting the pot on. And maybe there's some other stuff. But since there's a famine and there's not a whole lot of the word of God around, somebody else goes out into the field. Have you went out into the field? Do you understand that God has called us into the field and the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few? God has called us into his field to do his work. We're supposed to go out into the field and not gather wild vines. We're supposed to go out and gather rebellious vines and teach them the word of God. 
went out and gathered herbs. I was reading this and I couldn't help but think in uh, uh, 39 it says, well, 39 it says herbs and pot. Why aren't the pot smokers bringing this into their, their reason and why you can grab all this stuff? I'm teasing. I'm just jesting. Went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it a lap full of wild gourds. Can you see that? You ever done that before where you're peeling potatoes and you have on an apron and you get a lap full of potatoes or something? You see that scene? That's what he's doing. This person's going, okay, I got this. I got my thing. And he's filling his whole lap full of these wild gourds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. Why would you put something into your heart that you don't know what it is? Why would you read all of these lying books that talk about stuff, these movies, these radio? Why do we put stuff in our heart that we do not know it's the word of God? Why would we put it in our food and eat it and digest it if it's not the word of God, if it's a wild vine? And so often we do that. We, go, we listen to any teacher. We listen to any word. We listen to anything that tickles our heart, even if it's the word of God being taught wrongly. I was talking with some people this week, and you know what they said to me? I better be careful. But they said, Oh, we go to this church, and this is what we do. And our pastor, what he does first is psychoanalyze people. And then the other part is he takes scripture, and he tells us what it meant then and what it means today. And then he does comedy because he's a comedian. First, he's a pastor or a psychoanalyzer. Second, and then he twists his scripture. Third, that'd be a good name for a band, Twisted Scripture. <laughs> Rock band. Yeah. yeah. Like Twisted Sister, <laughs> Twisted Scripture. I got that from some comedian. I stole that. Listen, why would you put wild food when you have the pure, unadulterated Word of God that sanctifies and cleanses you? When you have Christ there setting the table, bringing the food, He is the bread of life. He's wanting to bring it with you and sup. He's knocking on the door. And we want to have a lap full of wild gourds and put them in the stew. Even when we don't know what they are. Do you know your Lord? Do you know the bread of life? Do you spend time with Him? Verse 40. Then they served. Who's they? It to the men... To eat. Now I want you to notice the progression. At first it's it's boiled stew for the sons of the prophets, right? And then somebody served it to men to eat. And then when you get down to verse 41, it's going to say serve it to the people that they may eat. See, we're supposed to be hearing the word of God, learning the word of God, and handing the word of God out to other people. There's a progression going on here. So they, verse 40, they served it to the men to eat. Now it happened as they were eating the stew that they cried out and said, look who they're crying out to, to Elisha, man of God, there is death in the pot and they could not eat it. Well, how do you know there's death in the pot? You got to have something to compare it to, right? How do they know that death was in the pot? Somebody sitting there must have realized Oh, is that what you put in there? Those are poisonous. So you have to have somebody to sound the alarm and say there's death in the pot or you can't do nothing about it. When you are eating and supping the bread of life, when, you have your, when you're, you're trying to get your heart right with God and you're seeking Him with your whole heart, then the Holy Spirit will tell you. The Word of God, which is a mirror to your soul as you're reading it, will say this is not good food. There's poison in this pot. This is going to twist your life. This is going to kill you. So what do you have to do? You have to go back. Look what he does. He didn't do anything fancy. So he said, bring me some flour. And he put it in the pot and said, serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. Listen, he just did the natural. God did the supernatural. Elijah didn't heal no soup. God healed the soup. And the soup was healed by faith. And you can eat things that are poisonous and it will not harm you. And we're told in Mark chapter 16. 
But the flour, again, is the ingredient for the bread, the bread of life. You know, when you go back to, to 1 Kings 17, Elijah did one of the same things. But what did he do? Remember the widow that was taking care of him? She had just a little bit of flour and just a little bit of oil. And there was a, a, a famine, a drought. I'm sorry, there was a drought, no water. And he said, make me a little cake first. Because she was gathering sticks and was going to go in and make that last bit of bread with her little bit of oil. Now, see, we got it with the oil and the bread here, the oil and the vessel. Make a place for the word of God. And now we got flour to get the poison out. She was just going to make a little bread and her and her son was going to go die. And the word of God said, nope, don't do that. Don't give up hope. Make the word of God first in your life. And what will happen? It lasted for the whole three years of the drought. And it fed all three of them. It fed the word of God. They were having fellowship. There was a, there was a, there was a, 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 a strand of three cords that were together. God, the word was there, and so was her and her son, her fruit. So he just put some flour in there. He put the, the, the ingredients this is how God purifies your heart. It's how he purifies my heart. When we let him put the ingredients into our life, the word of God, by the spirit of God, the washing and the cleansing, and it creates love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in our lives. But we have to be supping with him. We have to get into the word, prayer, and fellowship. Just bring me some flour. Pretty simple. But again, we talked about it a while ago. Doesn't that take faith to believe that? See, people, people get mad. Oh, you and your word of God. Read the word of God and it'll be okay. Listen, it might be hard to believe when you're in the middle of a storm, but if you're reading the word of God already and then the storm comes, you already know where to go. I always tell the testimony about a street fight that happened in Lafayette and a gentleman swung a baseball bat and instead of yanking the guy away from the baseball bat, he was pushed into the baseball bat. Mm. And it saved his life. Because when a home running hitter hits a baseball out of the ballpark, it's when he gets full extension, when he gets the full swing. And so the further you are away from that bat when it hits you, the more it's going to hurt. But when you're pushed into it, it barely can get you. So the closer you are to God, when the impact of life comes, the least amount of damage it does to you. So you can be so far out that the devil hits a home run. If you're away from God and you're way out here... It can knock you out. It can kill you. It can paralyze your life. That's why you don't wait till the problem comes to look in the Word of God and go, what's God say? You're already in His lap. You're already in His house. You're already in His throne room. You already have made a place in your home because of the Spirit of God is leading you to fellowship with God. And you're already there. So when it happens, you're like, God's got this. He's taking care of me. I'm okay. And you ask him for wisdom and he gives it to you and you obey. And there's no famine for the word of God and the counsel of God and the wisdom of God in your life. There's no delusion about what's going on on the planet in your life because you know God. And you know he took the penalty and the power away. And one day he's going to take us and glorify us. And we are now in his house. Listen to me. Do you have faith to eat of the word of God? To get the poison out now? Or are you going to wait till it gets really bad and go, now what do I do? Listen, he wants a relationship with you. You don't have to run to somebody else. Run to him. It's okay to run to people who know the word of God, but grow up where you don't have to run to somebody else all the time. You can apply the word of God in your life. And if that happens, if you're letting him purify you by continuing to put the ingredients of God's word, the ingredients of God's prayer, the ingredients of God's fellowship, you continue to let him put the ingredients in 
where he wants them to go. See, he, the servant himself, Jesus, is preparing your heart, cleaning your heart, washing and cleansing your heart. He's the one doing the work of sanctification. He knows what to put in the pot, in the heart, at what time and when to do it. If you let him do that, guess what will happen next, right? It's the next text, 42. You can become from anywhere you're coming from. Listen, this guy comes. A man came from Baal Shalisha. You know what that is? Baal is Lord of the Flies. This is a city that's really close to Gilgal. Doesn't matter how evil you've been and what you've been doing. Baal Shalisha means three-time God or thrice. I got some notes somewhere. I can tell you that. You got to find them. Baal Shalisha means... Thrice great Lord, lowercase g, God. Baal is Lord of the flies. He's Lord of death. This man was from that area. This man was from that area and he gets saved. It doesn't matter where you were at. I was listening to someone today talking about Mary Magdalene. Seven demons. Jesus cast seven demons out of that woman. How mean would you have been if you had seven demons? Much like me. We don't even know if seven means seven. It might have been a complete amount. It could have been a legion. But Jesus can heal anybody. This man, Bel Shalisa, he comes from this place where they worship Baal. And now what's he doing? He got saved. He's living for Jesus. And brought the man of God, he brought to Elisha bread. Pay attention. Jesus is the bread of life of the first fruits. Guess what else Jesus is? This is Good Friday today. Why is it Good Friday? Sunday's coming. Jesus is the first fruits from the dead. What's that mean, Greg? Well, if there's a first fruits, that means the promise of future fruit. And if we allow him to feed us his word and sanctify us and purify us, then we're going to be the latter harvest. We're going to be the others that come in the late fall harvest. Because Jesus rose, we rise. Because he got up out of the grave. Now we know that that's the evidence that his life was perfect and pure. He was never sinned. He's holy. And we can be set free and come back into the family of God because of his first fruits from the dead. He rose again. But look, this man who was from worshiping the devil, Baal, the, 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 the Lord of the flies, Lord of the dunghill, small g, God, thrice God, brought the man of God some bread of the first fruits. That meant, when you, listen, when you have the Spirit of God come into your life, into your vessel, that's the first miracle, filled for oil, which is the Holy Spirit, you make a place in your house, in your home for the word of God and you bear fruit and you get new life. Then you begin to eat what he supplies for you at the table. Somebody might put some bad gourds in there, but he's going to keep adding ingredients and kill that off. It's going to not harm you. No matter what goes on in life right now, it cannot harm you. You're indestructible. That's what it says there. And, and there was nothing harmful in the pot. Nothing of evil influence. I'm sorry, that's back in verse 41 again. I just realized I left that out. Nothing of harm. Now listen, that word harmful is from two words. I had to go back. Sorry. Verse 41. Nothing will harm you. Why? Because you're indestructible until God's finished with you. Why? Because you can only go to sleep and wake in his arms. You can't die anymore if you let him feed you. Listen, it's from two words. One of the words in the original sense is pasture which means the arrangement of the flock in the right place that's a strange word and the second word is bad evil adversity affliction calamity it's it's hurtful sorrowful and trouble but listen if you are a one of the sheep of the pastor of his field and he's feeding you he's going to lead you beside the still waters he's going to lead you into good pastures to eat 
You're going to be led by his spirit to have a table in the presence of your enemies to eat from. Psalms 23. Nothing to harm you. He's in complete control. He's sovereign. Listen, COVID cannot kill you. Nothing can kill you. Because death has been taken. There's no sting. There's no victory. How is it a victory for death to take you and you wake in the arms of Jesus? The place that every person who's in the family of God wants to be in heaven with God where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more heartache, no more deception, no more intoxication, no more COVID. Why do you look at me every time you say intoxication? I don't drink no more. Oh. I'm, not looking, I'm, not, I'm not looking at you. If something convicts you, that's not what I'm talking about. No, I'm, just I'm looking all around the room like this. <laughs> I'm looking all around the room. I was not looking at anybody with any ill intent, believe me. <laughs> but there's nothing harmful if we allow God and put his ingredients in our life And takes the poison out. Elisha, this man, brings 20 loaves of barley bread and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. Look, and, and newly ripened grain in the King James says, full ears of corn in the husk. That's what it says. Full ears of corn in the husk. So, see, listen, here's some bread of the first fruits. Listen, and this is what happens in a life that has been changed. This is what happens in a life that has the spirit of God and has made a place in, their house, place in their home and in their house for the word of God and has began to eat at the Lord's table. You know what you do? You give the first fruit of your days to God. You give the first fruit of your life to God. You give the first fruit of your talents. You give all the first fruits. What's that mean? The first things. The first day of the week. Jesus rose. We give him the first day for the equipping. The first of your money. Now, I know a lot of people get irritated by that. But you give the first fruit of your money, not because God's broke, but it trains your heart to give to God and trust God first. You trust God first. When I was serving the devil, I gave him all of my money. I gave him everything. In fact, I would give him your money. I'd come to your house, rob your house to get your money so I could go give it to the devil. And all God says is if you want to train your heart, to live in my house, you train to trust me that if you give me the first fruits of your time, I'll give you energy to go to Bible study. If you give me the first fruits of your money, I'll show you how to spend it properly, and then I'll use it to take care of other lives at the same time. But you're training your heart. God doesn't want your money if you don't do it in order to train your heart to worship him. It's a worship to God. And it doesn't matter the amount it just so happens that in the Bible, a tithe means a tenth. But in the Old Testament, throughout the year, they would give over 30% of their money to God in different offerings and in different ways. And I said this, and I say it many times, the guy that, that started Heinz Ketchup, he learned to live and he would give 90% of his money to God, to the ministry of God. Now, if you're making $40 million a year, keeping 10% is a lot of money. So... But you still have to have a heart. Think about it. If you make $40 million, you still have to have a heart to give away $36 million. Think about that. Now you can say, oh, that's only, I still can live off $4 million. Really? You just gave away $36 million. Seems to me like our hands would be clenched around $36 million. I don't think the Lord needs that much. I think I know how to spend my $36 million better than God. Listen to me. What are you doing with the first fruits of your life? God gave you the first fruits of his loins. He gave you his first and only son. And his first and only son lived a perfect, spotless, sinless life and died and became the first fruits from the grave. And when he gave that life to God, that gives you and me a right to become the fruit of God. The fruit from his death becomes us who believe that he is Lord and God raised him from the dead. 
So he gave him that first fruits. Now listen, hang on to this. Don't get lost. This guy came, he gives this, and then he gives 20 loaves of barley bread, right? The first fruits. I'm sure 20 means something. I haven't got it, so I'm not going to go there. Barley bread. And then he gave him these full ears of corn in the husk. You know why? There's going to have to be some work there. See, those ears can't be eaten that way. They have to be harvested. They have to be ground. They have to be made into bread. They have to be ground down. This other, so there's some work that's left to be done. God gave us Christ the first fruits. We give our first fruits. Then we get up and go do the work of the ministry. There's more work so that other people can eat. But we do give. And we give ourselves away as servants. And we give our, and we take everything that we have and it belongs to the kingdom of God. You might not have nothing but a widow's might, but it belongs to the kingdom of God because you're bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus. And what did he say? This man who used to serve Baal maybe. And he got saved and brought to the word of God. Brought to the prophet of God. Bread of the first fruit and some ripened corn in the husk. He said give it to the people that they may eat. See he's providing for people that they may eat. Over here we're providing for the prophets. We're training people. We're discipling people. But there's other people that need to come and eat. And he says, give it to people that they may eat. Notice this is what these two parables are about, or excuse me, these two miracles are about, is people eating. What are they eating? Are they eating poison? What are you eating? Are you eating the word of God? Are you having fellowship with God? Are you giving back to God? Listen, what is? look at verse 43. But his servant. This is the first place you're going to see the character of Gehazi begin to change. But his servant. See the contrast? When there's a but there, there's always a contrast. Said, what shall I set this before a hundred men? He's questioning the gift. He's questioning the food. He's questioning the, the, the ability of this food to provide for the people that are there, a hundred men. Does it remind you? Does it remind you of Jesus feeding the 5,000, Jesus feeding the 4,000? And they say, oh, send them away, Lord, so that the people, they're hungry, so they can go eat. They've followed us this many days. And he says, well, we'll give them something. And he says, well, uh, what's four loaves and seven fish going to do? He said, have the people set down. And they obeyed the word of God. And God fed so many people. 5,000 and 4,000, and that's not including women and children, and there was food left over. Now look at this, 43, the servant questions the gift of God. And then he said again, he said it again, he repeated it. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a matter be established. Give it to the people that they may eat for thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. Listen, listen to me. If you are receiving from God and you're filling your heart with the right food, you're allowing the ingredients of God to go in your heart, nothing's going to harm you. But then you have to give back. You want to be giving back of the first fruits. You want to be giving some of what God has given you so that others can eat. And you might think, well, I don't make very much. And all I'm doing is living off of this. And that's not very much. Listen, the widow's might. Jesus says she gave more than anybody else because she gave out of her poverty. She gave more than those who might have gave 36 million because she gave from her heart. And she was fully trusting upon God. And that's what the word of God is calling us to do. To have faith that God will take care of you. To have faith that God will protect you. To have faith that God will be your provision. And that when you eat his ingredients, the word, prayer, and fellowship, confessing your sin, then you're going to give of your first fruits and offer back your service so that other people can eat and there'll still be some left over. So he said it before them, and they ate and had some left over according to the word of, God, word of the Lord. It's always going to be according to the word. It never fails. Every promise is true. 
He said he's going to bring a famine. He said they'll be searching and they won't find it. He also said they're going to deceive us through pharmacy. Their merchants, their great merchants will deceive us through their sorcery. And even when he brings great wrath upon them, they will not repent because their hearts are hard. And then when we get to chapter 5 next week, God willing, what an amazing text of a great commander in the Syrian army who is honored, but he has leprosy. It's an amazing text. And you're going to see, listen, oil goes in the vessel. You make a place for God, for the word of God, to bear fruit from God. Then you continue eating what God tells you to eat so he can take the poison out, purify and sanctify. Then you start giving back of the first fruits. And then when we see Naaman, you're going to see that you have to keep dipping in the water. You keep dipping in the water, and he completes the work he started in you until the day of Christ Jesus. That's what Naaman does. He's told to go dip in the water seven times, and his skin becomes as a child's skin again. It's going to be a great text. It'll probably take us two or three weeks to get through it. It's so powerful. But don't miss this. In all of it, the servant of God, the servant of Elijah, Gehazi, loses his faith and goes after money. Because he doesn't feel like the word of God was doing what he should have done. Keep that in mind. The word of God always does according to what it says it's going to do. You can always trust it. If he says that there will be some left over and that he'll provide for you according to all of my... Uh, according to uh, all the riches of Christ my God shall supply for all your needs by Christ Jesus how's that verse go 419 of Philippians and my God shall supply for all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus you can trust that but there's spiritual needs first everywhere you look in the Bible it's always spiritual first because if there's salvation we're flipped back up to spirit, soul, and body. Spirit always has to be first. If you're going through something, say, how does this apply spiritually? Now, how do I align my emotions up to follow the spirit of God in the word of God? And how do I beat my body into subjection to go? You always put spiritual first. See, in sin, we always put the body first. I don't feel like doing that. I ain't going to do that. I don't care what God says. Spirit last. I don't care what God says. Disbelief, disobedience, no faith. But when we come to salvation, spirit first. What did God say? How do I get my emotions in line with that? How do I make my body obey that? And we ask for his power, his might, his strength. And we go in faith and we trust him. And he will always complete the work he started in us until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Read chapter 5 for next week. Begin to rehearse it and memorize Psalm 119.11. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you provide for all of our needs. Lord, help us to give back of our first fruits so that our hearts would worship you and trust you and you could use that for others. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.